now time for oral questions. I recognize the Leader of His Majesty's Royal Opposition. Good morning, Speaker. This question is for the Premier. If there's one thing that I hear all across this province, from Timmins to Windsor to Ottawa, is the need for mental health care and addiction services. I hear it from young people who are struggling with anxiety and depression uh, in rates higher than we've ever seen. I hear it from parents who are just desperate and would do anything for their children. But wait lists are months, even years long, for mental health services. Children and youth are waiting up to two years, two years, Speaker, to get the care that they need. Things can change a lot over two years. Kids cannot wait. Does the Premier agree that everyone deserves access to publicly funded, publicly de delivered mental health services? And the reply for the government, the parliamentary assistant and member for Burlington. Thank you, Speaker. It's a pleasure to have the opportunity to talk about our government's record on mental health. When we took office in 2018, Ontario's system Order. of care for people with mental health and addictions sure. challenges was broken because the previous government, supported by the NDP, never made it a priority. We, on the other hand, have developed and implemented the province's first long-term strategy for improving mental health and addictions care through the Roadmap to Wellness. And since then, we've increased annual funding for mental health and addictions by over $800 million. <laughs> Introducing new programs like the Structured Psychotherapy Program, which provides free cognitive behavioral therapy to adults struggling with anxiety and depression. Mr. Speaker, Response. we are the only government in this province's history that has ever treated mental health with the seriousness it deserves, and we are proud of our record of expanding services and helping vulnerable people get the care they need. Well Order. Supplementary question. That's embarrassing. That's an embarrassing response. The number of children and youth on, men <laughs> on mental health wait lists Order. has more than doubled under this government's time from 12,000 to 30,000 children on those waiting lists. That is on this government. It is getting worse every day, Speaker, but I want to talk about uh, a call that was made by Grand Chief Alvin Fidler uh, back in 2016. Nishinaabe Aski Nation asked the government to make public health a state of emergency declare it a state of emergency. And I remember when Grand Chief Alvin Fiddler called an emergency meeting because people, young people, are dying by suicide in their communities. No one Order. from this government even showed up. Wow. Shame. Shame. Does the Premier agree that delivering mental health care, like counselling, Question. like psychotherapy, at no cost to patients in Ontario, is the government's responsibility? Members, please take their seats. Respond. Member, Member for Burlington. Burlington has the floor. from the NDP or the Liberals about running an effective mental health system because they wouldn't know anything about it. We are the ones who designed the roadmap for wellness. We are the ones who created the Ontario Structured Psychotherapy Program. We are the ones who began collecting data so we can make evidence-based decisions. Order. And we are the ones who created the first cabinet portfolio in Ontario's history, mm. specifically for mental health and addictions. Mr. Speaker, our government has made unprecedented investments in mental health. We've created 60 mobile crisis response teams. We've opened mental health clinics mobile mental health clinics and funded 32 youth mental Response. health clinics across the province, including in rural and remote communities, so people, our young people can access the supports they need. 
Final supplementary. Speaker, health care does not end here at the neck, right? Mental health care is health care. If people in Ontario aren't able to access it free of cost, that is a problem and it is a failure of this government and their responsibility to deliver the basics. When two and a half million people don't have a family doctor, Ontarians are that much further from accessing publicly funded mental health care supports. There is a simple solution. Fund the community mental health sector, connect thousand more Ontarians to mental health services in their communities. So back to the Premier. Will the Premier support the official opposition's motion this afternoon to accept that mental health care is health care? Members, please take their seats. Member for Burlington. Mr. Speaker, each program that I've talked about so far is free for access to all Ontarians. The member opposite may be behind the curve, but since day one, we have been expanding access to mental health and supports for everyone in this province. After decades of neglect by previous governments, mental health is finally taken seriously, and it's our government that is doing the hard work building a continuum of care. We listened to the needs of our communities and have developed a strategy that's working. No thanks to the parties opposite who voted against every single measure Order. along the way. Uh, Mr. Speaker, it's easy to criticize, but it's harder to do the work of building an evidence-based system, and that's exactly Spons. what we're doing. Our approach is breaking down barriers, and we're getting more people than ever before the help they need where and when they need it. Order. Next question, the Leader of the Opposition. Thank you, Speaker. Uh, I want to go back to the Premier. In the last few weeks, we have heard from home care patients and from caregivers about what the shortage in supplies means to them. People with serious illnesses, severe pain, unable to get the supplies that they need and no end in sight. It is not enough to say they will get reimbursed eventually. It is not enough. These families need answers about how the government let this happen and when this is going to end. When did the government first learn about the shortages that were impacting so many people across this province? Member for Essex and Parliamentary Assistant. Mr. Speaker, everybody who requires medical assistance and medical supplies at home must receive them at home. This government insists that it is absolutely necessary that these supplies be delivered. It is unacceptable in the province of Ontario that anybody who requires medical supplies at home Order. should go without. That is why the minister has already communicated with the CEO of Ontario Health at Home and authorized and directed that any and all means should be taken to ensure that those medical supplies reach their destination and that those supplies which are so importantly needed are in abundance in the province of Ontario and they must be delivered. Mr. Speaker, anybody who has had to seek Response. assistance through another means may be reimbursed and we are making sure that that is already happening. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. The supplementary question. Well, Speaker, how's that working? Because I've got to tell you, I was in communities across the province this weekend, and I'm hearing from directly from providers and people who are ill, Order. and they are not seeing those supplies. So something is still not working. And with this government, Ontarians always come last. Their first priority is catering to their insider friends, to the corporations. They will never stand up to corporations on behalf of Ontarians. They are dismissing these stories that are coming out of home care. Doctors and caregivers under distress, patients suffering unnecessarily with no end in sight. So I want the Premier to answer how many people are still being impacted by these shortages and when can they expect exactly for these supply distribution Question. problems to be solved.
The member for Hamilton Mountain will come to order. The Minister of Auto Theft and Bail Reform will come to order. The response. The parliamentary Assistant, the Minister of Health. Member for Essex. Mr. Speaker, in the province of Ontario, people who need medical supplies at home absolutely must and deserve to have them delivered as they were requested and on time. We absolutely insist that this must be done, and it is utterly unacceptable that there be any interruption in the delivery of these supplies. The supplies are abundant. There is no difficulty with supply. There has been an interruption in some areas with the delivery of these supplies. Mr. Speaker, the Minister of Health has already communicated with the CEO of Ontario Health at Home, and if anybody in the province of Ontario has had any difficulty receiving these supplies and has had to seek them through an alternative source, they are entitled to reimbursement. I can advise this House that 83 per cent of these reimbursement requests have already been processed. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Member for Hamilton West, Ancaster Dundas, will come to order. Leader of the Opposition, final supplementary. Thank you, Speaker. And I can tell you that people of Ontario need and deserve real answers to these questions, not just spin. Right? They want to know who knew, for how long, and what did they do to fix the problem. We know there was a sudden change. Our MPPs here contacted the Minister of Health with example after example as it was coming in. Right? We know that Bayshore, the company that's responsible for the shortages, is a longtime donor to the PC party. Once again, it all comes back to who knows who in this government, and Ontarians will always come last. What is this government doing to hold Bayshore to ac uh, account, to get people the supplies that they really need right now, or is this Question. another case of insiders continuing to get off easy while Ontarians pay the price. Members, will please take their seats. Member for Essex. Mr. Speaker, it is absolutely important that people in the province of Ontario who need their supplies at home should receive them at home, on time, and as ordered. Mr. Speaker, already the Minister of Health has contacted the CAO of Ontario Health at Home and authorized that any and all means be taken to ensure that there is no interruption in the delivery of these supplies. In addition to that, Mr. Speaker, we've activated a special uh, telephone number, which is 866-477-7567. Anybody who requires reimbursement for an order should call that number and seek reimbursement. And in addition to that, the minister has activated a special assistance team to make sure that those deliveries are made on time Response. as required. That special assistance team is already being activated, Mr. Speaker. Thank you very much. Thank you. The next question, the member for Niagara Centre. Thank you, Speaker. Through you to the Minister of Health. It's now been 1,027 days since Welland Hospital lost its after-hours surgical services, and we have yet to hear a plan from this government as to how they will be restored. This government is failing to deliver on the basics for the people of Welland. We have proposed a plan to rebuild the aging Welland Hospital as a full-service hospital, including 24-7 emergency and after-hours surgical services. Will the minister support a planning grant to Niagara Health so that we can begin work today on the logistics of this project? I'm assistant the Minister of Health and member for Essex. Mr. Speaker, of course, when this government took office in 2018, the health care budget was $60 billion. It is now $85 billion for a 41 per cent increase to the health care budget. And with regard to providing more primary care, which actually keeps people out of the emergency room, this government has extended uh, an, an enormous expansion of the nurse practitioner-led program across the province of Ontario, adding thousands and thousands of people to primary Order. care. And in addition to that, Mr. Speaker, we've added a program specially designed for emergency rooms, which is the offload delay program, which provides assistance and other staff to make sure that ambulances who arrive at a hospital are able to unload their patient and get back on the road 
as required. All of these Spons. programs, Mr. Speaker, are provided by the government of the province of Ontario. Thank you. Member for Ottawa South will come to order. Supplementary question, the member for Niagara Falls. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. My question is to the Premier. Over the summer, while the Premier and his government chose to take a five-month-long break, we continue to experience a crisis in MRI wait times in Niagara. The average provincial wait time for MRIs in is 97 days, which is still unacceptable. But think about it, in Niagara, it is a walloping 349 days. My constituents, including seniors, have traveled as far away as Mississauga and to the United States of America to get an MRI, and they had to pay out of their own pocket. People are suffering because of the crisis the Premier created in health care staffing with Bill 124 and the ongoing underfunding. Speaker, when is the Premier going to properly Question. fund public health care services and ensure my constituents in Niagara Falls, Fort Erie, Niagara Lake get the MRI service they need when and where they need them? Thank you. Members will take their seats. Once again, the Minister of Auto Theft and Bail reform will come to order. Member for Essex. Mr. Speaker, we all know how important it is for people to get their tests, to get tests such as MRI tests and CT scans, and that's why, Mr. Speaker, the health care budget in the province of Ontario, as started in 2018 at $60 billion, has now gone to $85 billion in 2024. That's a 41 percent increase in the health care budget, providing services that have been uh, in place in the province of Ontario in all locations. Let me give you one fantastic example. In my area, the Greater Essex County area, we've added a new MRI machine at Erie Shores Healthcare, which has now completed its 1,000th test since this government put it in place. And in addition to that, an additional MRI at Hunter Regional Hospital that's doubling the number of MRIs in the, age, in the region of Essex County. Thank you. The member for Niagara Falls will come to order. The member for Don Valley East will come to order. The next question, the member for Bruce Gray Owenson. Thank you, Speaker. Speaker, my question is for the Minister of Energy and Electrification. The people of my riding of Bruce Gray Owen Sound remember the negative impact the Liberals had on our province when they were in power. Businesses and homeowners remember that under the Liberals, they had to pay some of the highest energy bills in North America. Life has, unfortunately, become more expensive for those same families and businesses because of the Trudeau Crombie carbon tax. Wow. That's why our government needs to take action to reverse the damage the Liberals created to our energy system and ensure that the cost of energy remains affordable as we plan for future growth. Speaker, can the minister please explain how our government's recent reforms will make energy more affordable for new homeowners and job-creating businesses? Assistant, member for Renfrew, Nipissing, Pembroke. Get to the member for Bruce Gray Owen Sound. Unlike the previous Liberal government, which left families burdened with unaffordable energy costs, we are committed to putting affordability at the forefront of Ontario's energy future. Extending the amortization period for electricity infrastructure investments from 25 to 40 years will lead to savings for new homeowners and, homeowners and businesses, making life more affordable. We are streamlining the connection process with a pay for what you use model keeping energy affordable. On Sunday, the Minister of Energy joined the Premier and Minister of Finance to announce the extension of the Ontario gas tax cut, again providing immediate savings for families at the pump. This is real direct support for the people of Ontario as the Liberals raise the carbon tax by another 23 per cent. Speaker, these reforms are laying the foundation for a future where energy is both affordable and reliable for the people of Ontario, something the previous Liberal government failed to do. Supplementary question. Back to the member for Bruce Creonza. I thank the parliamentary assistant for that excellent response. Speaker, access to clean, reliable and affordable energy is crucial for the economic prosperity of our province. 
past Liberal policies made electricity unaffordable, but our government must work to change that. As we continue to build for the future, we must implement measures that provide for more stable and affordable energy costs for all Ontarians. Our government recently introduced legislation that would, if passed, enable the implementation of Ontario's first ever integrated energy plan. Speaker, can the parliamentary assistant please explain how the Affordable Energy Act will ensure long-term energy affordability for Ontarians while supporting Question. the increasing demand for clean and reliable power? Parliamentary assistant to the Minister of Energy. Oh, sorry. The response, parliamentary assistant and member for Mississauga Lakeshore. Thank you, Speaker, and thank you to the member for that question. The Affordable Energy Act, if passed, is a critical part of our strategy to keep energy costs low for families and businesses while meeting the projected 75 per cent increase in electricity demand by 2050. Unlike the previous Liberal government, which neglected affordability, we are taking a long-term approach to ensure Ontarians are not saddled with the high costs they faced in the past. Nuclear energy is at the heart of this strategy. Nuclear currently provides more than 50 per cent of Ontario's electricity, and the Ontario Energy Board regulated price plan confirms that nuclear energy is cheaper than wind and solar. Speaker, this government understands that families want clean, reliable and affordable power. By ex expanding nuclear and cutting red tape, we ensure families have continuous access to affordable energy Response. that supports our economy and reduces emissions, unlike the cost increases of the Liberal era. We are building a strong energy future for Ontario. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you. The next question, the member for Windsor West. Thank you, Speaker. In Ontario, over 30,000 children and youth are waiting for mental health treatment, up from 12,000 in 2017. That's nearly tripled since the Conservatives formed government. The average wait for children and youth to receive mental health care is 67 days for counselling and therapy and 90 days, 92 days for intensive treatment. Some children wait up to two and a half years. Chronic underfunding of community health teams and interdis interdisciplinary teams with mental health specialist staff has led us here. The government is failing to deliver on the basics that Ontarians need, and we are living in dire consequences. Speaker, why does the Premier think spending nearly $650 million taxpayer dollars on a foreign-owned luxury spa in Toronto is more of a priority than investing in children and youth having immediate, community-based, universal mental health care supports? Again, member for Burlington and parliamentary assistant. Thank you, Speaker. Children and youth need accessible and reliable services if they are to grow into healthy adults. Since 2019, we've increased annual funding for children and youth mental health by $130 million through the Roadmap to Wellness. Over the last two budgets, we've added another $43 million. Unlike previous governments, we're actually innovating and collaborating with partners to support services that are specifically tailored to the unique needs of young people. We've opened 22 youth wellness hubs across the province, with another 10 on the way, including a youth wellness hub in Windsor. The $330 million Pediatric Recovery Fund also includes expanded funding for virtual supports like the One Stop Talk program, new live-in step-up, step-down programs, Spons? and training for clinicians on youth-specific issues. Children and youth are our future, and our government will continue to make investments in their mental health. Supplementary question. Maybe the member opposite didn't hear what I said. The wait list for children and youth waiting for mental health supports has tripled under your government. Tripled. They've also cut funding. They haven't provided base funding increases to community mental health agencies in over decades. Decades. Liberals and Conservatives are failing in the mental health file. Mental health care, Speaker, is health care. Data shows that when Ontarians are unable to find a family doctor, community health team, or interdisciplinary team of mental health care specialists like psychologists, social workers, and mental health nurses, or Ontarians can't afford to pay for their mental health care, their mental health challenges become more severe and complicated. 
This government is failing to deliver the basics needed to keep all Ontarians healthy. Investing in community-based mental health support is much less costly than hospitalization or incarceration. So I ask the Premier, will you support our NDP motion to deliver mental health care at no cost to individuals as part of Ontario's universal health care plan? Yes or no? Please take their seats. Member for Burlington and Parliamentary Assistant the Associate Minister of Mental Health and Addictions. The NDP are asking for a 5% base funding increase for the community mental health sector, but when we gave the sector that exact increase in last year's budget, they voted against it. Oh, of course they did. They said that mental, they. mental health is an afterthought. But we are the first government to ever create a long-term strategy for mental health and the first to create a ministeri ministerial portfolio for this file. They asked for evidence-based investments and we're the first government to begin collecting data on mental health programs precisely so that we can make evidence-based decisions. They talk about cancelling, counseling for adults and youth. We've created the Ontario Structured Psychotherapy Program to provide cognitive behavioral therapy for adults struggling with depression and anxiety. We've opened 22 youth wellness hubs, including one in Windsor, Ontario, with another 10 on the way for youth to access similar supports. We've done more for mental health in this Thank you. The member for Windsor West will come to order. The next question, the member for Brampton West. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. My question is for the Minister of Transportation. Peel Region is a rapidly growing part of our province, with new homes, businesses, and schools being built every day. That is why this region must have the roads and highways we need to keep up with this growing demand. The previous Liberal government know there was, knew there was a need for Highway 413. In fact, they spent millions to study the highway before they turned their backs on the people of Peel and abandoned the project altogether. The result of those studies were clear, Mr. Speaker. Our highways are at capacity, and things will only get worse in the next decade. We cannot afford to wait any long longer for new roads and highways to be built. Speaker, can the minister please share how our government is getting it done and building highways like Highway 413? Parliamentary Assistant, Member for Hastings, Lennox, and Addington. Thanks for that question from the hardworking member from Brampton West. Speaker, our population is growing, and we need more infrastructure to support the families moving to our great province. Under the Premier's leadership, our government is focused on getting people out of gridlock. That's why we're building critical projects like Highway 413 and the Bradford Bypass. These new highways will make it easier for you to get to where you need to go. And we know that after 15 years of Liberal inaction, an endless gridlock. Mm -hmm. Ontarians need relief. That's why the Minister of Transportation introduced the Reducing Gridlock Saving You Time Act, which will allow 24-7 construction on priority highway projects. By cutting red tape and streamlining construction process, we will get Ontario moving again. <laughs> Supplementary question. Thank you, Speaker. Bonnie Crombie and her Liberals do not have a plan to tackle gridlock. They keep saying no to investments that will keep our province moving. They said no to Highway 413. They said no to the Bradford Bypass. In Bonnie Crombie's own words, she has never supported Highway 413. And the NDP are not no better, Mr. Speaker. Some of their members want to tear down the Gardner Expressway. That would be a disaster for GTA drivers already stuck in bumper-to-bumper -bumper traffic. The people of Ontario deserve better. Unlike the Liberals, our government needs to be focused on common sense actions here, here. that will help tackle gridlock and provide Ontarians with transit relief. Speaker, can the parliamentary assistant please explain to the House what our government is doing to get drivers in Ontario moving again? Assistant Member for Hastings, Lennox and Addington. Thank you, Speaker, and thank you again to the member from Brampton West. Speaker. It's true, some members of the NDP want to tear down great highways like the Gardner. Under our plan to, to tackle gridlock, we accelerated the construction of the Gardner Expressway. 
and Ontarians are already seeing the, the real effects of 24-7 construction. Gardner's accelerated timeline is now four months ahead of schedule. Wow. Ahead! That's why in our new legislation, we will designate priority highway projects so that we can build faster and keep people moving. Priority highway projects will connect previously underserved areas, meaning goods will be delivered quicker, faster services, and less time for commuters to be stuck in gridlock so they can spend more time with their family. Speaker, our government will get Ontarians moving. Member for Ottawa Centre will come to order. The next question, the member for Toronto Centre. Thank you, Speaker. My question is to the Premier. After years of planning, this month, the University Health Network, as well as the City of Toronto, the federal government, in partnership with Fred Vector, converted a parking lot into a 51-unit supportive housing project. They are now housing unhoused patients who have been ending up in our emergency rooms. But this project had to go ahead, Speaker, without the support of the provincial government because they have waited too long. There is a solution on the table to build supportive housing. It will reduce ER visits. It will end chronic homelessness. Why is the government failing at the most basic step of this process and not at the table with them? Why is this province not committed to long-term funding so that they can build more supportive housing to end chronic homelessness? To reply, the Minister of Municipal Affairs and Housing. I appreciate the opportunity to answer the question. The member, of course, will know that uh, uh, we are uh, supporting uh, uh, homelessness. The homelessness prevention program uh, is at its highest level uh, in provincial history. In addition to that, Mr. Speaker, uh, uh, we have committed well over another $600 million uh, to both the City of Toronto and Ottawa. Uh, for the homeless, uh, homelessness prevention programs in both those cities. Uh, ostensibly, Mr. Speaker, we truly understand how important it is. That's why we're working very closely with uh, Ontario Big City Mayors. That's why we're working with Order. to ensure that the maximum amount of resources are put in place to help us uh, address this problem uh, uh, province-wide, Mr. Speaker. Thank you. A supplementary question. Back to the member for Toronto Centre. Thank you, Speaker. I did not hear an answer in the minister's response. Getting people off the streets who are sleeping rough, sleep, people who are setting up in tents in parks, is a very good investment. It is much cheaper to house people than to confine them to an expensive hospital bed. Supportive housing is needed to end chronic homelessness. We know that it requires 24-hour support, nursing care, a virtual link to emergency health services on site. This kind of care is not radical, Speaker. It's actually critical and proven to work. People on the wait list for supportive housing are literally passing away and dying while they are on this wait list. They are waiting for this government to step up. Ontarians are dying. Cities are broke. They need this government to be a partner. Question. My question once again is when can the University Health Network, the City of Toronto, the federal government, Fred Victor, expect a long-term funding commitment from this government for one of the most innovative supportive housing projects that we have seen in Ontario. Uh, thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. As I said, uh, uh, look, we've provided significant additional resources, uh, not only to the, uh, the City of Toronto, of course, uh, uh, to the, uh, the City of Ottawa and across the entire province, Mr. Speaker. We increased the budget for our homelessness prevention programs under the, uh, the previous Minister of Municipal Affairs and Housing uh, by over $200 million, bringing that level of support to the highest level in, uh, in provincial uh, history, Mr. Speaker. When it comes to our supposed partners at, uh, at the federal level, Mr. Speaker, this is a federal government that was supposed to sign a deal with us on Thursday and decided to walk away from the table ostensibly because they didn't want to fund homelessness programs in some of our other cities. London, o uh, Oshawa, uh, Windsor, uh, Mr. Speaker, these are cities that the federal government did not Fun. want to fund. We said that that was unacceptable, that we would stand up for all Ontario cities that are dealing with homelessness, Mr. Speaker, and that is why we're providing the level of funding that we are the, the highest. Thank you. The next question, the member for Ottawa South. Thank you very much, Speaker. My question is to the Premier. 
We all know that since 2018, the gaps in our health care system have grown wider. 2.5 million Ontarians don't have a family doctor. 11,000 people died on a wait list for something last year. And now patients at home in palliative care at the end of their lives are not receiving the pain medication that they need. And people living at home with a chronic illness or frail seniors are not getting the basic medical supplies that they need. We all know that. We all have heard that in here. We've all read it. So yesterday, the Premier said, I'm going to get to the bottom of this. So, Speaker, my question to the Premier is, will the Premier join our call to have the Auditor General look at the situation at Ontario Healthcare at Home? Goodbye. Parliamentary Assistant for the Minister of Health and Member for Essex. We all know how important it is for people in Ontario to receive the medical supplies they need at home, including people who are receiving palliative care. Those medical supplies are absolutely essential, and it's utterly unacceptable that there be any interruption in the delivery of those supplies. The Minister has already contacted Ontario Health at Home and given the directive to make sure that they take any and all means necessary and required to deliver the medical supplies that have been requested. The supplies are there. They need to be delivered. In addition to that, the minister has activated a call line where people can seek, people can seek reimbursement for any costs that they've incurred seeking supplies by alternative means. And in addition to that, the minister has already activated a special assistance team to make sure that the, logis the logistics system that delivers these supplies Response. does so as required. All of those steps have already been taken, Mr. Speaker. Supplementary question. Members, right, it's utterly unacceptable, just like it's unacceptable that 13,000 people in his riding don't have a family doctor. Wow. Speaker, I know that the other party leaders on this side of the House will join us in this call. The Premier should as well. So, my sisters and I cared for both our mum and dad at home at the end of their lives. It was hard. It was difficult. So when I think about the suffering that's happening right now and what these families are going through, Speaker, it makes me angry. It makes me want to get to the bottom of this. It should make all of us angry and want to get to the bottom of this. So if the Premier is truly a man of his word, and he wants to get to the bottom of this, then he will join us in asking the Auditor General to look at the situation at Ontario Health at Home. Will the Premier commit to do that today? Mr. Speaker, it's very admirable but that the member and his siblings have taken care of their parent, and that is a very good and proper thing to do. All of the people who are at home and require delivery of medical services at home, such as palliative, palliative care medical uh, assistance, deserve to have that delivered at home and on time. The delivery service for that is called Ontario Health at Home, and the minister has already communicated with Ontario Health at Home to make all and necessary means necessary to get those deliveries made. In addition to that, the minister has already activated a call line for anybody who needs to be reimbursed for medical supplies that were ordered uh, or ordered by an alternative means, and that has already been activated. Furthermore, there's also a special logistics team that has been set up to make sure that those supplies are made and delivered Response. where they're supposed to arrive at. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. The next question. The member for Halliburton, Fourth Lakes Broad. Mr. Speaker, my question, is, my question is for the Minister of Agriculture, Food and Agribusiness. Lindsay recently hosted the International Plowing Match. And I want to it was a very good show, and I want to thank everyone involved for putting on the show and thank the members here that attended. And you can imagine there were a lot of farmers there. And you know what the number one thing I heard was how hard the Trudeau Crombie carbon tax was on them. It increases the cost of everything a farmer does, which increases the cost of food for everyone. 
Recently, our government announced new investments focused on improving farmland. And this is an important step forward towards strengthening our food supply and supporting our local farmers facing raising costs. Speaker, can the minister please explain our government's recent support to our farmers? Recognize the Minister of Agriculture, Food and Agribusiness. Thank you, Speaker, and thank you to the member from Halliburton, Fourth Lakes, Brock. We all enjoyed going to the plowing match. Thank you for hosting us. Well done. Uh, our government secured a 25% increase in the Sustainable Canadian Agricultural Partnership Program. $569 million will be coming our way to support our farmers with important sectors and important sectors and in investments in the Resilient Agricultural Landscape Program, Agri-Stability Programs, Agricultural Drainage Infrastructure Programs, and the Grow Ontario Strategy. Why, Speaker, we're supporting our farmers to get the job done. From soil health to biodiversity to water quality, we are creating the environment for our farmers to improve their productivity, the gains that they've shown so well in the last 20 years. We have a thriving agri-food sector in Ontario, 871,000 people employed in the farm needs of the consumer's plate, 30,000 more since 2018. Our farmers are getting it done. Thank you, Speaker. A supplementary question. Speaker, I want to thank the minister for his hard work on this file, because helping our farmers is indeed crucial, and seeing our government take decisive action is encouraging. Ontario farmers continue to face ongoing challenges, and they need our government's full support. Rising land costs, labour shortages, and the negative impacts of the trudeau crombie carbon tax are shame, all shame. intensifying issues. Farmers have called for increased supports, clear policies and sustainable practices to secure their livelihoods and to contribute to Ontario's food supply. Speaker, can the minister further tell us how our government will continue supporting our farmers, especially amid the rising operational costs? Culture, food and agribusiness. Thank you, Speaker. Um, First of all, I want to thank the Minister of Municipal Affairs and Housing for the reforms he made of the provincial policy statement. Um, the expansion and use of agricultural impact assessments is an important tool that municipalities will use and our ministry will support. Putting an agri-food lens on land use is very, very important. And I'd also like to thank the Minister of Energy and Electrification for the largest procurement, energy procurement in our history, and banning the use of solar farms on prime agricultural land. <laughs> Speaker, these initiatives are important to supporting our agri-food sector. We are striking that delicate but important balance, Speaker, in ensuring that we support our agri-food industry along with a thriving economic growth throughout the province in Stellantis at Volkswagen. Response. Bottom line is this, Speaker. The carbon tax coalition opposite, they offer a carbon tax. We will always say no to that punitive, terrible tax that has hurt farmers. Thank you very much. The next question, the member for London North Centre. Speaker, my question is to the Premier. Workers need this government to step up. Since Conservatives took office, Ontario has lost more than 13,000 manufacturing jobs. That's on top of the 300,000 jobs lost under the last Liberal government. Ford doubled down Porter. on Liberal incompetence. Absolutely. When he was running for office, the Premier said he guaranteed Porter. he would bring back the jobs lost under the previous Liberal government, but his failures are even worse. Premier, why have you failed so miserably at bringing back manufacturing jobs to Ontario? Gordon, the Associate Minister of Small Business, to respond. I'd like to thank the member opposite for the question, so because it allows us to really talk about our record. So, Speaker, since we took office, more than 860,000 good-paying jobs have been added. Including nearly 200,000 this year alone. Just last month, Ontario added 43,200 good paying jobs across the province, and that works out to 92% of all the jobs created in Canada. Wow. But let's remind, let's remind the opposition uh, 
uh, of their record. Under the Liberals, supported by the NDP, our manufacturing sector was on the brink of collapse. Yep. They willingly chased away 300,000 manufacturing oh, jobs. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But, Speaker, today, Response. with this government, manufacturing employment is at one of its highest levels in 15 years. Wow. We've landed tens of billion dollars of new auto and manufacturing investments. But, Speaker. Thank you. Thank you. The supplementary question. Thank you, Speaker. You know, after the Liberals lost 300,000 jobs, Premier Ford said, hold my beer. Congratulations on not only taking away more jobs, but destroying services at the same time. Look at Stats Can. That's right. This government has handed out massive corporate subsidies, yet is failing to bring manufacturing jobs back to Ontario. 13,400 fewer jobs because of Premier Ford's failures. Ontario's unemployment rate is higher than the national average. Oh. Instead of cooking up schemes and dodging scandals, this government needs to invest in workers. Ontario needs to improve wages and working conditions, to improve access to public services and truly affordable housing that workers and employers need. Why has Premier Ford made Ontario a have-not province? Members will please take their seats. Minister of Labour, Immigration, Training and Skills Development. Thank you, Speaker. Thank you, Speaker. Um, you know, Speaker, I thought we got rid of Discovery Math, but it's alive <laughs> and well with these guys. Um, speaker, let's, let's zero in on the manufacturing Order. jobs. Let's zero in on those jobs. Let's talk about Windsor, for example. Thanks to the leadership of this member in Windsor, MPP Dowie, we're attracting incredible investment. Let's talk about over 2,000 men and women in building trades taking home a combined weekly salary that's into the million speaker. Millions. 14 million in payroll that wouldn't have happened under that party. We know we were scheduled for zero investments, zero manufacturing. Let's talk about, because I've got some constituents here today, Premier Tech in my riding, expanding. Custom Plastics, expanding. This party wants a service economy. They want nothing Spons. more than misery for Ontarians. <laughs> we'll create hardworking construction jobs, yeah. build a stronger here, here. province. No thanks to them. Here, here. Order. Order. The next question, the member for Carleton. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. It's an honour to rise and ask my first question as an independent MPP on behalf of the people of Carleton. My question is to the Premier of Ontario. There are many things the good people of Carleton want me to ask about, including what this government is doing to combat the drastic rise of anti-Semitism and violent behaviour on the streets of Ontario. However, my question today is on a topic that lies close to my heart. I ask this question on behalf of the children of Ontario, and in particular in memory of Joshua McNulty, an 11-year-old boy who tragically passed away in a drowning accident in 2018. On April 3, 2023, I introduced Joshua's Law, my PMB, which requires parents and guardians to ensure children 12 and under wear a personal flotation device or life jacket. My question is, why did this government promise to pass Joshua's Law before summer 2024, but then shut down the legislature one week early while ignoring their promise to protect the children of Ontario? Thank you. And to reply for the government, the government house leader. I want to thank uh, the member for Carleton for the question. I, I certainly am, am aware of uh, her private member's bill, uh, and I certainly understand the situation given that uh, the, the terrible tragedy uh, occurred in my riding. Um, I understand, you know, we, we talk about private members' bills, and really it's, at the, uh, at, it's up to the, uh, the member to, uh, to move things forward. I'd be more than happy to, uh, to sit down with uh, the member for Carleton and discuss it uh, uh, in, in more situation. However, um, you know, this place operates uh, uh, in a situation where we, you know, not every private member's bill passes. When I, uh, when I first was elected to uh, the House in 2010, um, legislative research told me that at the time since Confederation, only 3% of private members' bills actually uh, make it into uh, legislation. Again, Speaker, uh, I don't want to, uh, to couch um, the success of, of the member, uh, but I'd be pleased to, uh, to have a discussion with you and discuss this further. Thank you. Supplementary, the member for Carleton. My question is again to the Premier. 
Accidents are the leading cause of death for children in Canada, and not wearing a life jacket is the number one risk factor for drowning by boating. Life Saving Society's 2024 edition of Ontario Drowning Report shows 68% of drownings occurred from May to September, aka boating season, and 60% of drowning accidents happened in lakes, ponds, and rivers. Drowning Prevention Research Center study showed that 67% of children aged 5 to 14 who died from drowning were not wearing a life jacket or personal flotation device. The Ottawa Drowning Prevention Coalition says that drowning is one of the leading causes of injury-related incidents for children under the age of 5. Mr. Speaker, life jackets save lives. Full stop. Will the Premier live up to his promise and pass Joshua's law as soon as possible and make life jackets mandatory for children 12 and under in Ontario, especially since this bill has been passed already and is waiting to be going to third reading? Thank you. Government House Speaker. Madam Speaker, I'm, I'm not going to preclude uh, how uh, legislative committees deal with uh, private members' business. That's up for committees. And, you know, but I do want to say to the member um, you know, very clearly, there's no one in this House who understands more about safety on the water than someone who has the words Thousand Islands and Rideau Lakes in their riding name. I, we, I have a long history uh, with, uh, with the area's boating community. I understand uh, the importance of safety. Uh, any tragedy on the water that could be prevented is, is something that I think all legislators, no matter what political stripe, uh, should put their mind to. Again, to the member, I want to congratulate her on bringing this forward uh, as a private member's bill. I want to congratulate her on uh, it making the next step into uh, going to legislative committee. And again, I, I, I offered uh, a conversation with her uh, in my response to the first question, and I'll leave it at that. Response. Thank you. The next question. The member for Whitby. Thank you, Speaker. My question is for the Minister of Public and Business Service Delivery and Procurement. Our government is working hard to build and expand critical infrastructure across the province. This work is essential to our economy and quality of life, from roads and bridges to broadband networks that connect communities. Under the previous Liberal government, Projects were often delayed due to the slow completion of locates through Ontario One Call. These delays put unnecessary strain on contractors who saw their timelines extended and their ability to take on new projects affected. Our government must address these issues and deliver a faster, more efficient locate system that supports timely infrastructure development. Speaker, could the minister please explain what our government is doing to streamline the locate process. Good question. Minister of Public, Business Service Delivery and Procurement. Mr. Speaker, I thank the excellent member for Whitby for that excellent. very important and timely question. Oh. And he is indeed a champion for Whitby and Durham Region and a model parliamentarian. Uh, there was a serious problem under the previous Liberal government with unacceptable delays in regard to the one call process. And so we took action. And under this government, in this provincial parliament, we tabled the Building Infrastructure Safely Act, and it received royal assent March the 6th, 2024, after unanimous passage in this House. We saw that there were expense and lost time and delays under the Liberal government, but thanks to the reforms guided by our BISA, our Building Infrastructure Safely Act, we have now tripled the daily volume of locate requests compared to 2018. We're getting it done, we're building it safely, and we're making Fox. great progress. Thank you. Supplementary. Well, thank you to the Minister for that response. My constituents will be pleased to know about the improvements to Ontario One Call and how they'll speed up infrastructure projects in Whitby. Speaker, Ontarians expect our government to make the most of every tax dollar, especially on large-scale projects. Delays and budget overruns caused by confusion about underground utility markings or poorly managed timelines hurt the value of those investments. Unlike the Liberal members in this House, our government must remain committed 
to protecting taxpayers' dollars and ensuring efficiency in infrastructure projects. Speaker, can the minister please explain the steps being taken through Ontario One Call to reduce locate costs for construction projects while ensuring the highest safety Question. standards? All right, that's good. For public and business service delivery and procurement. Mr. Speaker, our government was elected and re-elected on a plan to build, a plan to build safely the Ontario of tomorrow. We have accelerated the building of roads, transit and critical infrastructure faster across Ontario. We've cut red tape. We've introduced accountability through penalties for slow work at all stages, from timely locates to responsible construction management. That is our plan as we look forward to building responsibly and safely and faster. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Thank you. The next question, the member for Toronto St. Paul's. Thank you, Speaker. My question is to the Premier. Toronto Caribbean Carnival, the largest festival in North America, is in desperate need of emergency and sustainable multi-year funding. Carnival contributes nearly half a billion dollars, Speaker, to Ontario's GDP and creates roughly 4,000 direct jobs, supporting approximately 3,000 small businesses. Its reach is unparalleled in this country. The annual festival costs roughly $3 million to produce, and this government's investment this year was $125,000. Oh. The Festival Management Committee is asking for $2.5 million annually for the next three years to survive, and they need this investment yesterday. Without this funding, Speaker, the very existence of the Toronto Caribbean Carnival is in jeopardy. My question is to the Premier. The Premier promised, in person, at the carnival this year Question. that they could count on him for the funding support they needed. Will the Premier step up, adequately invest and save Toronto Caribbean Carnival today? Yes or no? Please. Members will please take their seat. Minister of Tourism, Culture and Gaming. Thank you, Speaker. I love Caribbean culture, and my seatmate knows I love Caribbean food. In fact, this year at Carnival, it was a little awkward because uh, I was following my nose for some jerk chicken, and when I got to the stand, the uh, operator informed me, sir, you're about an hour and a half early. I won't make that make the mistake again this year when we're on time for Carnival, but Speaker, the member is correct. It is an important economic driver. It is important for cultural enrichment. It is important for the Caribbean community, and it is important for visitors to our great city, Speaker. I was there when the, the Premier made a promise, uh, and I know we're working on that promise as we speak, uh, Mr. Speaker. I know Mishka is here, and I know Adrian as uh, chatting with my team as well. Speaker, this, as I said, those supports are ongoing uh, and those supports will come. We're going to continue to invest in the Toronto Caribbean uh, Carnival. We look forward to next year's Carnival, bigger and better than it was even this year. Thank you. Supplementary question, the member for Spadina, Fort York. Is a really disappointing answer. Horrible. We've got the CEO and the director of the Toronto Caribbean Carnival here. The side the Toronto order. Caribbean Carnival welcomes 2.3 million visitors to Ontario. It generates $500 million in economic activity. And from this government, they get what the Premier called a paltry $125,000 in funding. And it's not just the Toronto Caribbean Carnival that's at risk. Ottawa Festivals Network reports that most festivals in Ottawa had their funding cut by this government 50 to 75 percent. The Tulip Festival in Ottawa had their funding cut in half. This government cut Aurelia's Mariposa Festival by funding by $100,000, and the taste of the Danforth was cancelled last Cancel. year because of a lack of funding. The Toronto Outdoor Picture Show reports that most Toronto festivals are at the breaking point. So my question is to the Premier, why is this government failing question. to provide basic funding and threatening these festivals and the thousands of jobs and small businesses that they support that are part of Ontario's $86 billion tourism industry?
Disappointing, Speaker? You want to talk about disappointing? That member has voted against every single measure of support for all the festivals you just mentioned, all including really. Toronto Carnival, Speaker. Now, I'll reiterate. I was there. That member was there when the Premier said there will be increased funding for next year's Carnival. Why won't they take yes for an answer? I already said we're working with my team. I already okay, said we're working chill. with Premier's office. Position all they do is spin negativity in this chamber, all Speaker. Let's do things a little bit differently. Let's be positive, Speaker. Let's think about the great festival for next year with increased supports as the Premier Premier said, fire up the fryer, let's get that bacon sharp, heat up the doubles, we're on our way for the Toronto Carnival. Stop the clock. We're not quite finished. <laughs> Start the clock. The next question, the member for Windsor to come see. Thank you, Speaker. Uh, my question is for the Minister of Sport. Oh. Children and youth across our province deserve access to opportunities that help them be more physically active and engaged. Speaker, we know that investing in organizations that promote Physical and mental well-being means helping our children develop the confidence and leadership skills that they need. That's why our government needs to continue supporting Ontario families, ensuring they have access to vital resources that deliver high-quality, tailored and active recreation programs in their communities. Speaker, can the Minister please tell this House what our government is doing to help kids stay active in Ontario while keeping costs down for families? Thank you, Speaker. The member is absolutely right. Sport and recreation keeps our kids active and provides a huge boost to local economies. That's why our government is working to build a better Ontario through sport. And this year, we are investing $14.6 million in Ontario's after-school program. This investment supports over 110 organizations that are helping to provide sport and recreation activities for more than 13,000 children and youth in communities across the province. It should come as no surprise that the opposition voted against this program in the 2024 budget, proving they don't care about the needs of their own constituents. That's in stark contrast to our government, who is using every tool at our disposal to fund programs and initiatives that make a huge difference for families, and that's what we'll continue to do. Thank you. Thank you very much. That concludes our question period for this morning. We have with us in the